Hey, what's up everyone? I'd like to welcome you to this first video in the ongoing series I'll be putting together related to introducing the Java programming language and development for beginners. Now, Previously, I went over the necessary steps to installing the Java Runtime Environment and Java Development Kit, as well as the Eclipse IDE, onto both Windows and Linux hosts. And since I'll be using Eclipse for the majority of my tutorials, I recommend you check that out and just make sure you're up to date with the necessary prerequisites before moving forward. Now for this particular tutorial, and before we begin getting into any actual code, I'm going to go over a few of the major concepts and the terminology used not only for Java, but also object-oriented programming as a whole. And this will hopefully help you become a little bit familiar at first with these concepts, but don't get too overwhelmed or discouraged because we're going to cover all of this in much more depth and detail as each topic comes up in subsequent videos. So I put together a quick PowerPoint presentation, which I'll go over with you. And to begin with, we'll get into the background of Java. Java was released in 1995 by Sun Microsystems, and it is now owned by a company called Oracle. The goal of the language at first was mainly for portability. They wanted you to be able to write your code once and run it anywhere. And in doing so, hopefully reach a much wider audience than you would if you had developed for one particular platform, such as, say, Windows. The main process is that you write your Java code, you run through the Java compiler, which turns it into Java bytecode, and this bytecode gets run inside the Java virtual machine as an application. Now some of the recent successes that Java has had to give it a boost, Java is the main language used in Android application programming, and it is also the language that was used to create the popular game Minecraft. But Java is also heavily used in the enterprise environment to handle a lot of the backend server and database functions that businesses have come to rely on. Currently we are at Java version 7, and one thing I just wanted to touch on, there's a lot of talk lately about Java security vulnerabilities. And what a lot of these articles fail to mention in their headlines or in the article themselves is that most of these are actually attributed to exploits in the Java browser plugins and not the Java language as a whole. And since this is only a small subset of what Java can be used for, it's kind of given the entire language a bad rep. Okay, moving on, the major concepts that I want to go over are objects classes, inheritance, interfaces, and packages. And the first one we come to are objects. And similar to real world idea of objects, such as cats, a bicycle, or a phone, we can think of objects in programming as having states or descriptions. So again, using the cat objects, we can think of describing a cat by its color, by its age, by its gender, or by a name we assign it to differentiate from one cat to another. Now similarly, objects also have methods or functions, or what we might define as behaviors. So a cat, for example, can run, it can eat, or it can meow, and these would all be behaviors or functions that we could define for the object cat. Now this brings us to classes, and classes form the blueprint for which objects are created from. They specify the states or the variables, and the behaviors or the methods for the objects that are created from it. And we can take these classes and inherit from them. And I've designed a little tree here to kind of define this a little better for you. At the top, we have a class called animal. And then from that, we derive two subclasses, one called cat and one called horse. Now, cat and horse would refer to this animal class as their parent, or in other words, the super class. Now, similarly, we can take a cat and we can further subdivide it into a lion class and a cheetah class. And so lion and cheetah would refer to cat as their parent class, or again, their super class. But they're also inheriting from the super class animal. In this example, we have animal is the super class to cat and horse. Well, all animals have certain common characteristics. So let's say all animals have legs, they have eyes, they have size, and they have weight. All animals also have certain common behaviors. So they might have movement, eating, and seeing. Well, the subclasses of these might expand further on this information, but in different ways. So a cat might have claws, whereas a horse has hooves. Cats would hunt their prey, whereas horses would graze on grasses to eat. Lions and cheetahs are both types of cats, but they have distinct differences. For example, their fur coat are different patterns. Now we have interfaces. And an interface helps us to enforce specific criteria for a given class or a series of inherited classes. This is mainly concerned with what and not very much concerned with how. 
So for example, if we have a bicycle class, but we want to make this an interface. So we have a bicycle interface and we want to say that any bicycle class that we make from this should be able to exhibit these following methods. They should implement a method called turn, a method called speed up, a method called change gears, and a method for slowing down or called brake. Now this list of methods only specifies what functions a bicycle must implement, but it says nothing about how they are actually implemented. And that is left up to you when you code each class that implements this interface to design it how you want. Now we come to packages, and packages are really just a way to structure our code and our classes and group them together in some hierarchical or organized way. So in a large group project, we might quickly want to identify where a certain class is, and we can do that by defining certain packages that would hold things. So let's say we're making a game and we want to break it down into packages, for example, covering maps, another one covering the loading of music and sounds. We could have another one that holds all of the classes attributed to characters, and another one covering the artificial intelligence or the mechanics of the game. Now this allows programs to also maintain a smaller footprint, which we'll get into uh, a little bit later. So now we come to the Java language basics, and with that we have what are known as the primitive data types. For numerical values, we have integers, or int, and this is a numerical value, whole number, 32-bit signed integer. And we'll get into a lot of this as we start to use them and explain it in more detail. But there are also different types of integer or numeric values. We have a byte, which is only an 8-bit representation, a short, which is a 16-bit representation, and a long, which is a 64-bit representation. Now we also have floating point integers, which are decimal values, and we have a double, and we have a float. And again, these differ based on their bit length. We also have a Boolean type, which assumes only two possible values. These are usually used for true or false. Or similarly, we can think of binary, where we can only have one or zero for each bit. And a lot of the times, these are used for what are known as flags, for controlling the flow of our program. And we'll get into that as we start to talk about loops, such as the while loop. We also have the character type, or char. And this is actually a 16-bit single Unicode-based character in Java. Now this differs based on different languages, but it's all the same concept. And we'll see how these are used in a little bit. And finally, we have something called a string. And a string is technically an object, but a lot of times it is also referred to in the same context with the primary data types. So it's a data type for storing a series of characters. For example, we can have a string called name where we assign Alice. And strings are always declared with a capital S, whereas the previous ones that we saw all have lowercase. The value of a string is assigned by using surrounding quotation marks, double quotation marks particularly. And like we said, um, these strings are a special case of objects that make them act somewhat like primitive data types in Java. And they are also immutable, which we'll get into a little bit later as well. Now finally, we detail the sequence of events for Java code execution. And a basic program would be structured like this. In the first line, we have a comment. And this is not actual code. This is a little bit of information that we can store for ourselves for later. So we might want to put at the top what this program is so that uh, the next time we open it, we can quickly read what this class is doing or what this program is doing. The next line we have is called the public class first program. This is a class declaration and it is opened with a curly brace which is then finished with another curly brace down here. Then we have the main method public static void main and this just tells the program where to start executing the first line of code. So here this is the first line of code that would get executed in our program and it simply holds the value for hello java into a uh, variable that we define as statement. Now this next line here prints out whatever we want it to print out. So here we specify print out say hello to Java. And then the next line we print out the value of statement which we had set as hello Java. Then we close the main method and again we close the class. And that about does it for the major 
aspects of Java, and we'll start covering all of these in much more depth in the next video.